It's Amy Davidson. How are you? Another beast. That was such a fun movie to make. I enjoyed every second of it. Vampires and all the scary, cool, you know, stuff that happened. <laughs> um, and give you a piece of advice. Just don't go out there. Hey there, this is uh, Dave Foley, and uh, forgive, forgive me if I'm a little gruff sounding and or a little uh, incoherent. Don't go out there. So don't go out there is the advice. And um, and also, it's Nether Beast Incorporated, which that's I don't hear that much. I'm going to be honest with you. I I had fun making that movie, um, but it did not it did not not do a huge business. And it's not something that I really ever hear anyone uh, bring up at all. Um, although every once in a while I still run into Jason Mewes, who was in that as well. Uh, always, always a good guy. Uh, but uh, but yeah, Nether Beast was a fun, uh, weird little movie uh, that strangely had Robert Wagner in it as in a cameo. Um, and uh, I, I, as I said, I had a wonderful time making it. Although I had a Although I did have a, I made it with a crushed uh, big toe, and we made it in Phoenix in the summer, where it was about 120 degrees every day. Um, but still, I had a good time. So, uh, so thank you. And I, I think I've rambled long enough. In a world where zombies, ghosts, serial killers, and vampires all exist, it's Nico, Brian. Mike and Dustin, and they are all that stand between you and the films that could end the world. Welcome to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast. Just want to thank all our fans and listeners. We really appreciate all the support. You all are awesome. Uh, before we get into tonight's film review, I just want to give a quick shout out to our website, don'tgooutthere.com. Everything about our podcast is on our website. Definitely check it out. We have our episodes and interviews. From episode one to the new weekly release, uh, we've done some fantastic interviews in the past with some humongous horror legends. Check out our interviews tab. It's a lot easier to find them there instead of scrolling through iTunes, Spotify, etc. Uh, we also have our store. We have some new t-shirts. Uh, they're awesome. Uh, check those out. Rip your favorite podcast. We'd, we'd love to see that, honestly. And we also have Shan's Etsy page attached as well. Uh, her tumblers are selling like crazy. Go, go cop some of those. Uh, we also have all of our social media links, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow us, like us, subscribe us, all that good stuff. We have met so many great people through social media doing this podcast. All four of us know each other through social media, so make that connection with us. We love interacting with you. Uh, and the last thing we'll shout out on our website before we get into the film review is just our Patreon we call Blood Donors. Uh, we have two different kinds. We have the traditional monthly reoccurring kind. Uh, it takes a big burden off of us. None of that money goes into our pockets. It just goes directly back into the podcast, site hosting, you know, you making YouTube videos, et cetera, things like that. Uh, it really helps us out. And we also have one-time donations. If you're a big fan of a movie, you want us to review it, uh, we have that option available as well. Just check out Blood Donors on our website. Uh, tonight, we're closing out the month of September. We're about to get into October, you know, Halloween month, uh, ar arguably – our biggest month of the year, honestly, last last October, we business was booming last year. So I'm super excited for October. But before we do that, we're, um, let's close out September with Brother Dustin's pick. Go ahead and announce your pick, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I picked a movie that rarely anyone has seen. I've never met anyone that else has seen this movie. Um, and that was clear based on the comments that I saw on our social media posts. I went with 2007's Nether Beast Incorporated. Uh, I told the story last episode, but you know, last September, uh, Steve Burns, you may know him as Steve from Blue's Clues, he took over the Blue's Clues Twitter account and posted a very personal message to viewers of the show saying, you know, why he went away to college, blah, blah, blah. It was very nostalgic. Um, I didn't, I was a little too old for Blue's Clues, but my little sister watched it. And so I was definitely familiar with it and, uh, you know, knew him. So that just sent me down a rabbit hole. I was like, eh, what else has this guy been doing? And I saw that he was in a movie that was a horror comedy. And I was like, oh, I'm going to watch it because I see it's free on Amazon Prime or Prime Video, whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to watch it. And if it's good, I'm going to pick it to review. Or if it's really bad, I'm still going to pick it to review one day because those are some of our finest episodes. But then I looked into this, the movie and I'm like, 
Okay, so it's a it's a take on vampires. All right. I look at the cast. I'm like Daryl Hammond, Amy Davidson. I know her from Eight Simple Rules. Um, Judd Nelson. Okay, David Foley. Who uh, shout out to him for doing the intro to the show, but also. He's the voice of Flick, which is one of my favorite Pixar movies, uh, A Bug's Life. Jason Mewes, who is a two-time alum to this show now because he was in that horror classic Scream 3. Um, That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> not to mention Robert Wagner. Like, there's some uh, – this is an incredible cast. And I watched it about a year ago, and I was like, yeah, I'm picking this movie. It's really fun. It's not like if you're t- if you're going in this movie expecting like a masterpiece, this is going to be the best thing you've ever seen. Not going to like it. But if you go into it just like wanting something that's got a good runtime, that's fun and just a very easy watch. And I think this is a good movie for you. All right, I'll go next. Like Dustin said, never heard of this movie. Um, really didn't know what to expect, honestly, because there's not much content out there reviewing it uh there's only really trailer on youtube and one guy's reaction uh so there's not a lot out there so i'm happy that dustin picked it just so we can give the movie a little bit of notoriety maybe some fans will check it out but i'll just be the first say i wasn't a huge fan of the movie honestly it's just not my cup of tea kind of thing um i'm not really a vampire movie guy or like a horror comedy kind of fan and it's a mixture of both so it really just wasn't for me i couldn't I couldn't separate Steve Burns from, you know, the guy from Blues Clues. I just kept seeing, like, I was waiting for a notepad. I was waiting for him to sing a song or something. But like Dustin said, the movie does have a good runtime. It's it's kind of, it, it, it does have some funny moments. Uh, it's never really boring. I'm just, kind of like with Ghostbusters, I'm just not interested in the content on the screen. Uh, doesn't mean it's made bad or not well acted or anything. It's just, just not my cup of tea. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Brian, you want to go next with thoughts? Real quick, I knew that you would feel that way, though, because when I picked it, I go back and I look at some of our ratings that we've done movies, and I look at Tucker and Dale versus Evil, which is one of the better horror comedies that you can find, in my opinion, and you gave it a six, so I was like, yeah, he's going to hate this shit. <laughs> well, I like Tucker and Dale versus Evil the first time I watched it, but it's like, I don't know, the comedy just doesn't, it doesn't resonate. I don't know if that makes you. sense or not. I got you. Um, you know, I, I'm in the absolute majority of the people uh who probably agree and i had never even heard of this movie before dustin picked it at all nope. uh but i'll be damned if, if it's not fun you know plus i'm a sucker pun intended for vampire <laughs> movies so you know as we all know um you know is, is it some great movie like dustin said absolutely not but i had fun with it uh, apparently it's based on a short called the nether beast of berm tech industries which you can find on youtube but it's only you know five minutes um, and, and that makes a lot of sense because it really, to me, feels like a kids in the hall skit, you know, mixed with like an episode of the office or even Belko experiment. Um, Steve Burns, you know, I mean, obviously, like you mentioned, he gets a lot of credit because of who he is being in a movie like this. And like Dustin blues clues was a little after my time. I was a Pee Wee Herman kid. So I liken this really to, to Pee Wee Herman when he did Batman returns, like, um, it was, it was weird seeing him in something else, but it didn't take me out of it. Um, you know, but like you said, this has a really sneaky, good cast, um, like really good. And, you know, Steve and friend of the show, Dave Foley, I thought killed the roles. Um, hell Robert Wagner even makes an appearance. Like you said, it, you know, this feels like a throwback to those like cheesy B and C horror movies from back in the day. And now that I think about it, I wonder like how this would have been maybe black and white, but anyway, fun. It's what I use to describe it. You know, I'm not sure how much I'm going to cut out of it yet before I post it. But when uh, when Dave did the intro, like Dustin mentioned for the show, he was actually shocked and said we were the first ones to ever ask him about this movie. He said he never, never gets asked about this movie, which I can definitely understand that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, again, I like everyone else here, I'd never heard nor seen it uh, until this past week. And... I thought it was okay. Like, I thought it was fun. Like, it's not my favorite thing that we've ever reviewed. But, I mean, it's a fun watch. And now, I think this is, I'm not going to lie to you, and it's okay, but this is stretching the term horror comedy pretty far. (laughs) To me, this is just a straight-up comedy. But, obviously, it's a comedy about vampires, so it falls in the umbrella. 
you know, it's in there. Um, Look, this cast is really cool, man. It's a, it's a really cool collection of actors. I mean, you know, Daryl Hammond and Jason Mewes and Steve Burns. My ma- I mean, Amy Davidson, Robert freaking Wagner is in this movie. How in the hell did they land Robert <laughs> Wagner to get in this movie? Uh, just a really random collection of 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 uh, of talent that I thought did really well. Um, now I mentioned in our group chat, and this is kind of the way I describe the whole movie. This is a long episode of The Office to me, in in camera cut style and dialogue. Uh, you know, even some of the thematic stuff because duh, it takes place in an opera, an office. Hence the name Nether Beast Incorporated, but. Uh, overall, man, I look, it's a short watch. It's not something I don't, I'm not sure I'll revisit it that often, you know, maybe here and there, but it didn't, you know, make me angry watching it like a Freddy's dead or something like that. So <laughs> it's, it's a fun watch. And now I'm like Nico, where I don't really love vampire movies at all. Quite frankly, there's the occasional one that can get me, but this movie's almost like not a vampire movie. It's, no, no, no. It's not like any other one I've seen. So, um, nothing but mostly positive things to say. And I will say this is maybe the hardest time I've ever had taking notes because the first 15 minutes of the movie is explaining the history of nether beast. And I kind of just want to be like, Hey, y'all go watch the first 15 minutes. If you want to get what's going on, then come back and listen because he does a better job explaining it than than all four of us could. So, yeah, again, good watch. I'm glad Dustin picked it, though, because also, like Nico said, it deserves to have eyeballs on it. You know, I think that every movie we do deserves to have eyeballs on it, even the really crappy ones. I said it. I said it. Even Jason Takes Manhattan deserves to be watched. Well, duh. But how about this? So, the two <laughs> movies <laughs> the two movies that I've picked recently that no one else has ever heard of, this one in WrestleManiac, we can all agree this one's better, right? I would yes. watch WrestleManiac. Uh, I don't you would know watch WrestleManiac for you? Oh. Okay. Well, it depends on the mood I'm in. Am I in the mood for a horror movie or am I in the mood for a comedy? Okay. Because I would. Yeah, I think this one is way better. I'm curious. They're, they're both better than rubber, right? Absolutely. Oh, yes. All by right, a, let's by go. A, by, a, <laughs> by a country mile. And I'm talking about like. You know, well, West Virginia country mile. So there's if that's the bar we're setting things at here, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we jump into scene by scene, Mike, I agree a hundred percent. I'm sure it was hard for y'all to take notes because it was it was hard to take scene by scene because it's a lot of a lot of uh, dialogue and a lot of you know just explanation. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, definitely. A, I think I texted in the group chat. This is not an easy movie to do scene by scene on because it's just a lot of you know auto just kind of describing the history of the nether people, or I can't remember what they're called, the, he's, the nether people, something like that. But uh, any more opening thoughts before we jump into the scene by scene? Let's get it. All righty, Dustin, glad you picked it. Let's jump into it. Film starts with animated office guy walking down the hall and steps in a corporate setting as opening credits roll. We meet Otto as he makes office conversation, and he goes into his boss's office, and he's made to sit down by a man with a wooden stake in his heart. Turner needs his help, and they don't have much time. Otto asks what happened to Mike. Turner tells him he needs the Donegan rewritten by Tuesday, and Otto asks why he killed Mike. Turner says Mike was a vampire. Otto asks the signs of telling someone is a vampire. Turner laughs, saying, take his word, he had blood on his shirt. More fun conversation as Turner says they can't speak on religion in the workplace. He tells Otto to burn Mike's husk within an hour. Otto is so fl- flabbergasted. Otto exits the office and sees his co-workers eating body parts, drinking blood, as more animation and title card. Otto now b- begins to narrate on himself and the people he works with. We see Mike's body being put into the incinerator. Turner tells the staff he felt justified in killing Mike. Otto says the term vampire is foreign to his ears. We're not vampires. It's a media thing. We don't have fangs or fly. We were referred to nether beast in the Middle Ages. We prefer nether folk. He speaks on the weird clump on their heart. Blood alone won't do it. We need human flesh as well. We see a group of people eating a human head for dinner. He now says they are reliant on the nether stone. They have to be within a mile of it to survive. Turner slips up saying he's bringing in a consultant. The office goes into scramble mode, swapping out the vending machines and water jugs. 
Otto now speaks on the origins of burn tech. Otto now explains the not PC term, and forgive me, people, but this is what the movie says, of retardation. Basically, Alzheimer's for vampires. The consultant walks up to the building and rings in. His name is Steven. He's been in the business for 22 years. He tells his staff he will not be implementing layoffs as the others think he looks delicious and that Turner has made a mistake. It's about procedure, not personality. Turner introduces Stephen to Otto and Henry. Stephen says he's going to rely on Henry's expertise. Otto takes Stephen on a tour as Turner explains Stephen isn't here for money reasons. The company is referred to as a well-oiled machine, but Turner says it's getting a bit squeaky. Otto now introduces Stephen to a co-worker with a stuffed dog. Stephen leaves telling Jewel to have a wonderful evening, and she tells the others the consultant has left. Otto now describes their living space. They live at the office building on the fifth floor. They don't sleep in coffins. Emmett wakes up take, talking to who he thinks is his roommate and drinks blood, but is bludgeoned in the head. We now meet Waxy Dan. Otto now says they change their names every 10 years. Alex Haley's roots gave them inspiration that made them return to their original names. Turner introduces Rebecca and Henry to Pearl, Mike's replacement. Turner says we need fresh blood, fresh ideas. Henry tells Rebecca, no need to panic. We have two weeks probation and we can get rid of her. She says Turner is slipping fast. Otto describes the remedial rinse, but it could cause brain death. Turner introduces Otto to Pearl. He has a crush on her instantly. Turner calls him a guru and she hopes he'll be patient with her. The primary reason Burn Tech exists is James Garfield. We now see a reenactment of Bell not being able to find the bullet in Garfield. Stephen is at the round table saying Burn Tech has been around a long time, so they're doing something right. Amos asks about slow and steady, and Cecil begins to argue with him. The two now argue over the tortoise and the hare. The two fight as Cecil calls the rabbit an asshole. <laughs> Turner takes lead of the meeting now. All right, Brian, that's the opening set of scenes I got. What'd you think? So right off the bat, I love the credits. Uh, it kind of gives me a Pink Panther <laughs> Christmas vacation vibes. So just by that, I kind of prepare myself for the movie that I'm about to get. And, hey, it worked out because, I mean, just like those, we get a non-serious comedy with over the toppedness. I guess that's a new word, over the toppedness. Um, and I, and this doesn't mean shit, but my favorite looking cartoon of any of the cast that was shown was Jason Mew's character. It was drawn perfect. I don't know why that stood out to me, but just throwing, <laughs> that, just throwing that out there. Um, and that People You Meet song, bro, that stuck in my head all day. <laughs> all day. All day. Um, two minutes in, and we get a fucking wooden stake sticking through a dude's chest out of nowhere. Okay, let's go. I look great, too, um, especially given the budget, which I know Mike will touch on later. But props to the entire art department there. Uh, also, great delivery of the line where uh, Daryl Hammond says, the blood is right there on the front. Oh, I guess you'll just have to take my word for it. I, I laughed. I just I thought Hammond was brilliant in this scene. Best work of the movie for me. Um, and Mike did some quality work, but he's dead. I loved that. <laughs> guess you can't expect quality work from a dead guy. Um, now, if we're nitpicking, you definitely got to look past the entire foot on my guy's plate just walking around. I thought that looked terrible. The fire was pretty terrible looking. But again, you just got to know what you're watching here. But it's our job to do that and nitpick. So here we are. Um, also, the photoshopping on all the old Civil War era photos was pretty terrible. But I think they were supposed to be bad. But either way, I laughed, especially at the Turner pictures. Man, those things were fantastic. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, they didn't blend the face into the uh, oh, the man. head at all. You can see a hard line across the forehead. Is hilarious. Especially the one with uh, Turner being over uh, Abe Lincoln's face. That, fucking, yeah, that, was, yeah, that was that great. Was... <laughs> and what the fuck is Emmett the security guard wearing? Like, he's got Wolverine hair. Workout gloves. No idea what's going on there, but okay. Um, the last thing I'll say is I'll give it props for what it does with vampire mythology. Again, I'm a big fan of pretty much all vampire movies, but this is just, I mean, it's something different. You know, I thought it was creative and also, you know, pretty smart because, you know, with the budget restrictions, you don't have to worry about a lot of usual vampire shit that, you know, goes comes along with a vampire movie. Um, and speaking of Pink Panther, fucking Robert Wagner, James Garfield, Quick, what's his fa what's his best movie he's ever been in? Why is it Austin Powers? Go ahead, Mike. I love Austin Powers. Um, I also love this open. I agree with you. I look, I like this little animated thing. It kind of I didn't even think of the other you know movies they're related to, but you're absolutely right. Where it's like, oh, okay, this kind of puts me in a whimsical mood, which 
again, I enjoy if I know if, if, if I know what I'm getting myself into, I don't want the trailer for Halloween ends to drop. And then the next the, the first thing I see in the movie theater on October 14th is some animated whimsical shit like that would make me mad. But in this setting, I think it works. And I love <laughs> I love this opening scene. I think it's great. Like I there is something about the nonchalantness. I don't know if I even said that right, but I think you know what I meant of Daryl Hammond's character just being, or actually Steve Burns' character being like, what happened to Mike? <laughs> he said, Oh, I've been meaning to take care of that. That was such a great line. I love it so much. And like you said, I think the steak looked good. If you know, any money they had for effects, I definitely spent on the steak through the heart. Um, yeah. I thought yeah. it looked really, really good. I also noted the fact that they had their like heads cut out of like, different pictures and just like basically glue sticked on <laughs> onto the famous right. dead people. I thought that was great. Um, really enjoyed explaining the difference between quote, the quote unquote popular culture vampires and how they're not that and kind of breaking it down into being, you know, nether beast and you know, the, you know what they really are and, and why they have this attachment on their heart and all of that stuff. Like I thought that was really well done and informed me well. So um, look, there's some really good comedy dialogue here that I, I just kind of think you have to go watch the movie to see. But I think it's a really strong start. Like, this movie is goofy. And like I said, I get very strong office vibes right off the bat. So that makes me want to makes me want to continue to watch it because I enjoy that style of comedy. Yeah, um, I, I like the opening credit scene, the fun animation. And I really like that they kept that as a theme throughout the rest of the movie. Um Get you know, right off the bat, we meet Otto and it's Steve. Like, that's just an awesome bit of nostalgia for you. Uh, I love the way the first death is shot, like how he sits down and then the camera kind of pans out and it's eye level with the stake through his heart. I thought that was cool. Um, nice touch there. And Turner being so calm about it on the phone and Mike's just sitting there dead. Like, I love everything about that scene. Like you said, Brian, uh, Daryl Hammond really killed that. No pun intended. Um, we get funny back and forth between the two here. The The dialogue is funny about Mike being a vampire and his death. And I, I really liked or laughed when he said, why did he recoil in terror when I shoved a crucifix in his face? And Steve's just like, he was Jewish. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was funny. Um, yeah. And when he said, uh, did you try to kill him with any other way? Well, why would I? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like that that whole dialogue was awesome. Uh, Jeff eating the foot on the plate. Like, yeah, I agree it looked like shit, but uh, I liked it. I liked how it was a nice, subtle way to show us that they were they actually were vampires, and it starts to lay out the plot here. Uh, the retardations is a... Uh, yeah, that's certainly a term to call the condition, and... It's funny, too, when he goes to describe it, he goes, yeah, I'll admit it's not the most PC term. Um, this movie came out in 2007, even less PC in 2022. Uh, I love the mixture of animation we get in the film. Like I said, it adds just, to me, it just adds to the funness of it. Um, the I really liked when they were switching the stuff out, like the blood water cooler, the blood types, and the soda dispenser. You had a... O and all that and they just put it out of order the ribs and the stacks and the or in the vending machine i thought that was a great touch just funny stuff there i really like how this movie uh <laughs> picks james garfield <laughs> like how fucking random is that but it's it's awesome uh i love the subplot of him and alexander graham bell um and the history there many of the details surrounding james garfield's assassination uh an attempt to save and Graham Bell's attempts to save him are historically accurate. So that was kind of fun. Um, Daryl Hammond's delivery though is just great. It's, it's the star of the show here because how he delivers his lines. Um, Cause it's not like top tier acting, but it's done in a way that's like, it's bad in a good way. So it works. So a lot of times when you watch a movie, with a low budget, you're like, God, these people suck. These, this acting's horrible. I've seen better acting in pornos. But here it works. Um, I like when uh, when Pearl is introduced to Otto. And Otto's at his desk there. There's a picture frame sitting on his desk that has a blue paw print on it. So that's kind of a nice 
nod to Blue's Clues there. Um, and the last thing I put on this scene is just like you said when we're talking about the your thoughts on the movie. There's just a lot of dialogue in this movie, but one of the lines that stood out to me was when they were arguing about the uh, the tortoise and the hare. And he goes, "The rabbit's an asshole," and he goes, "You don't even know that rabbit." Like <laughs> that shit just cracked me up. And it also, uh, anytime I hear the tortoise and the hare, I think of the Ninja Turtles, the first movie. When they're watching Tortoise and Hare, the cartoon, and he's like, uh, Ninja kicked the damn rabbit. So I was hoping someone would say that, but it didn't happen. But overall, it was a good open, man. I'm thoroughly entertained right off the bat. And it was during this set of scenes when I watched it the first time. I'm like, I'm definitely picking this eventually. <laughs> All right, we're at lunch now, and the chef welcomes a new employee and offers her pot pie with no human flesh. She gets a salad now and asks for creamy garlic dressing. And the whole break room panics, and Otto now tells of their issues with garlic. Jeff and Dow now describe men scratching their testicles. Pearl tells Otto she's heading out, and he says, thanks for her help. It can be overwhelming. Pearl asks Otto if they ever do happy hours, she'd like to go grab a drink. He tells her he doesn't have a wife, but he has a dog. He's lying and says the dog's name is Jeeves. Maybe another time, she asks, and he agrees. We now see Otto playing basketball, and he describes Providence Night. The night they can leave the building and do some shopping and etc. and leave the just leave the building. He now tells us sunlight isn't as harmful as movies describe. More basketball, dinner, and weightlifting now as he's told to give her the eye of the jackal. The lunch lady from earlier is in the kitchen now as she is attacked from behind by an unknown figure. Otto says Monday is going well for a Monday and says he asked about happy hour. Steven asks Otto about intercourse <laughs> and then Otto says he hid from him the rest of the day. The chef speaks on unhappiness with his staff, not getting the white collar rotation. Turner tells Jewel it's been nice working with you and he can't exit the door. He asks if something's wrong with the door and she says there's nothing wrong with it. Other co-workers come restrain Turner and drug him. He's on a hospital bed and the doctor says he can be sedated 24 hours, but he can't recover under those conditions. Henry and Rebecca speak on his schedule for Turner. Otto now tells the Elton John story. Waxy tells him we need to go. He tells Otto he'll take care of the wine and let her down easy. Eye of the Jackal. Otto goes into Four Peaks Brewery to meet Pearl. She tells him Berm Tech's a little different. Turner is eccentric. He speaks on vampires a lot. Otto spends it as a business term. He asks her now if she's been married. She says once and when she, when she was 19. He was a ventriloquist and she says she has issues. We see Rebecca in the kitchen and she grabs a knife after hearing some noises. Pearl continues telling him about her first engagement. She constantly had the worst thoughts of groupies. She now gets worked up sexually, describing the moves of a ventriloquist. She says, this is nice. Maybe we can do it again, and he drinks his beer awkwardly. Rebecca is in the kitchen and opens a door and sees someone asking, what are you doing here? Otto and Pearl leave dinner, and he explains he has family things, and they whiff on a hug. Waxy appears with wine, and Otto asks, what the hell are these? He asks where he got them. He says a convenience store. Jeff walks into Otto, knocking coffee all over him. Pearl and Otto are awkward as Turner walks up to Stephen. Turner doesn't remember him. Stephen asks, how long have they had this thing? It's a sign saying, love those cripples. Stephen doesn't even know where to start with this. Turner says, stay away from human resources. All right, Brian, this is the next set of scenes we got. What'd you think? <laughs> Look, that cripple sign with Stephen is freaking hilarious. You know, it's, it's funny that is exactly our slogan here. Don't go out there. Employ the lame and infirm. That's how I got this job. Uh, but <laughs> right right off the bat, Franklin Abercrombie sneaking in a plate of shrimp scampi back in 1958. Spoiler, might be my favorite kill. It didn't show a ton, but director Dean Ronalds, I've, I, I think, did a good job with his cuts right there. I think they're very effective. <laughs> fucking, fucking garlic, man. What are you going to do? Um, so a nitpick here. I did think that the nutsack scratching conversation and the start of this set of scenes was, was trying too hard. And so while we're here, that's kind of the thing to me, like the start of this movie, like last set of scenes, I felt like was really good world building. It had me interested and spoiler alert, the last set of scenes does as well. But these middle group of scenes here where it's just kind of where I feel like there's a lot of filler, but, uh, you know, but during this, it, it does really show and let Amy Davidson just be charming as hell. Um, like Dustin, I remember her from Eight Simple Rules, but I don't think I've seen her in anything else since then, honestly. Just um, my dreams. Just Dustin's dreams. I, I haven't seen her in those. That's weird. Um, oh, I thought I shared those with you. My bad. You probably have, bro. Um, 
but she does well here. You know, there's only really one scene I, I don't really care for that involves her, but I think that comes in the next set of scenes, I think. Um, it's just, I don't know, the, the dummy obsession subplot, I think, was just, it wasn't funny to me. It was just kind of weird. It was weird. But, uh, yeah. Uh, man, you can really tell the budget constraints, too, when they're on that basketball court. Uh, <laughs> the only the only part of it is lit is where they're standing, and it's a very obviously has no hoops. Like, they never shoot on anything. It's hilarious. They just kind of throw it up in the darkness and dribble against each other. What's crazy about that is they're clearly on a basketball well basketball court, though, because yeah. there's lines there for the uh, the lane. And they're not going the direction that they are. So it's not like they put the lines there because if they were, they would make them go the right way. I don't know. That was very weird to me, too. I, I noticed that. <laughs> that was it was crazy. I, don't, I would like to I would love to have somebody on this show to kind of get the behind the scenes on that. Um, also, Steve is dressed like Michael Scott in the basketball episode of The Office, like to a T. Um, <laughs> hilarious if you didn't notice it. But and, and I hadn't talked about him, but I think Jason Muse is great. Like not just in all the Kevin Smith stuff, but I legit enjoy him in everything. And like when in in if you if you hear interviews and stuff, he's just so down to earth. And uh, like even when he's not playing Jay, I I think he was definitely perfect casting here. Um, and I got the convenience store gag too. Eh, very very clever here where he got the wine convenience. That's, that's I picked that up. Very clever. Um, <laughs> Hey, did we ever find out, though, what the Eye of the Jackal was? Because, I mean, I know it was a gag, but it never, was never really actually explained, right? Or did I miss that? I'm just, just making sure. I think it was one of those, like, you're not supposed to know kind of things, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I took that as, like, that's just the look. Like, that's just what he was calling it, the look. You give a girl the look, and she knows. Like, that's, you know. Uh, okay. I don't know if okay. you've ever seen the movie uh, The New Guy with DJ Qualls and Elijah Dushku and uh, Eddie Griffin. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> it's kind of like a crazy that. eye. <laughs> What'd you do? Kill a cheetah? I love that movie. <laughs> oh, damn, I'm watching that one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that movie is underrated, hilarious. Um, and Orange County is too, by the way. I don't know. I just I put those true. two together all the time. Orange County is legit. And I think that's the movie we were trying to think of the other day that Harold Ramis was, was the dad in. I think it was either The New Guy or Orange County, now that I think about it. Anyway. Um, that's a few episodes ago. People listening probably don't have any idea what we're talking about, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, that's really all I had on this set of scenes. Um, these abductions, I, I just kind of felt like weren't done very well. Like they were always awkward and didn't really seem very realistic. So I just kind of felt like even with a crappy budget, those could have been done a little bit better as all. Well. Okay. Yeah. I don't have much on this set of scenes. Uh, I'll be honest. I don't really have much the rest of the way, but, um, I like the uh, the lunch having non-human flesh options and uh, their reaction when she asked for the garlic dressing like that. That was good touch. That was good for uh, comedy purposes. Um, the talking about the see the talking away the, about the best way to scratch a nut sack to me. <laughs> that's hilarious. Because I mean, come on, we can relate. I don't I mean, know. About yeah, you guys. but I think it's it's like funnier to talk about the quote than it actually was hearing it to me. I don't know. Oh, okay. I mean, that's fair, but yeah, I'm definitely a pinch and roll kind of guy. So, Jeez. um, <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when Otto said that uh, he had a dog, I was really wishing that he would have said the name was Blue, but I don't yes. know. Maybe that that no, may I, have, uh, that may have been too on the nose, but. You know, and then he he just no more on the jeans. nose than having a paw and wearing everything blue the entire movie, and then yeah, having a I know, convenience right? store joke with Jason Mewes. Come on, like you've got to put that in there. I yeah, agree. I agree. Um, and then you know, our we get our mystery deaths here, and I agree they could have been shot better, but as far as that them taking place, I like how they're subtle, like. They happen, and then we move on from it. We don't linger on it too much, especially on these first two because at this point because it's a nice diversion from the storyline they're feeding us about this new employee and, hey, here's our history. Um, so it's it's a nice diversion there. But I agree. They definitely could have been shot better. Um, it, like put it them looked, in a different location. Like they even had the bedroom like set already made because they showed it later. So, I mean, like have them like abducted in their room. I don't know, but it just seemed like – it was always in like a big open blank area where no, nothing else was happening. I don't know. It just was odd to me. I don't know. Yeah. And it was also just like kind of cartoonish how we could see the shadow and we didn't see the person. It was like, ah, come on. Uh, all right. But, um, you know, I, 
I'm still thoroughly enjoyed, so I'm not going to say too many negative things about this set of scenes or any of them. Inner tells Bunyan Rebecca can't be found. Cecil and Amos have been looking for hours. They don't think she made it to bed. Henry tells Bunyan to look for Rebecca and he'll try and get some help. The chef asks Otto about the wine he bought and says it would be perfectly complimentary if they were eating ass. Otto and Henry realize the old freezer is missing. (laughs) (laughs) That was a funny line. (laughs) It was. (laughs) Otto and Henry realize the old freezer is missing. Every last negative R nether stone is in there. Henry says they can last maybe up to a week without the stones. Otto can't believe their livelihood depended on an old freezer. Henry says Rebecca has the other key, and they can't tell anyone. Bunyan brings them back downstairs, and they find blood and taste it. They find a knife, but it had no blood on it. They find red hair on the ceiling, and Henry says to get Dr. Berman. Two men walk in Turner's office saying it's time for his vitamins with a big syringe. Dr. Berman says the blood is AB negative. It's either Rebecca's or we have a big problem as he pours it on pancakes to eat. Otto and Henry find a broken lock and begin to hypothesize. It's Emmett and Murdy. They both had access. Pearl and Jewel walk into each other. Pearl is looking for Bunyan and Jewel randomly brings up her her menstruating and walks away. Pearl walks into the kitchen and sees the staff eating flesh, drinking blood, and she storms away. She exits telling Jewel goodnight in a scared voice. She's outside the building and walks away. Pearl calls Otto and says, you're going to think I'm crazy, as she tells him what she saw. He says, let's meet and talk. I have a logical explanation. She says, this is nuts, and knew he was different. She says, why didn't you blow me off? And he asked for her not to judge them too harshly. He says her getting hired is the most exciting thing since Hickman Moody, and he says he enjoys work because of her. She gets up and walks away in tears. She's at home crying over dinner, reading a book on vampires saying it won't work as we see a ventriloquist dummy sitting at the table with her. Henry walks up on Otto, messing with a lot, and he tells Otto it's going on his permanent record. What if she tells someone? He asks how he knows so much about her. Next morning at work, Pearl doesn't show up. Otto says he's been put on babysitting duty with Turner. Pearl walks into the meeting, and Otto is in shock. We see Otto and Pearl getting rid of all of Mike's stuff for her. She says she doesn't get why they coop themselves up. Why aren't they out there being superheroes? Otto says this gift as a, is as impractical as can be. Pearl has Otto sniff something, and he says he found a huge piece of the missing puzzle. Dr. Berman tests it out, and it's chestnut red. It'll kill you. Spread out over time, it'll affect your organs. And the next set of scenes are the ending. Brian, what did you think? All right, so this is my least favorite set of scenes in the movie. Um, first of all, man, this investigation by Bunyan and Otto looking for Rebecca maybe the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Like no, nobody notices this gigantic ass chunk of hair and scalp on the ceiling till fucking Dick Tracy Henry finally sees it. Uh, it, it's like I said, last set of scenes, like there's just too much filler here. And I kind of felt like too quote, try hard in this set of scenes. I mean, that detective work scene goes right into Turner talking to his mouse, which we talked about a little bit a little earlier. Um, and that isn't a euphemism for anything. It was a computer mouse. And, uh, <laughs> didn't really it just it didn't really resonate with me or it wasn't funny then you have the blood and the pancake bit and the scene i was referring to with pearl earlier that i didn't care for where she's having the dinner conversation with the dummy from the movie goosebumps it was just at this point it was just turned into like a naked gun or like a scary movie four, whatever they're on you know type of movie you know what i'm talking about it just kind of made it my least favorite set of scenes overall um I mean, maybe Brian Ronald's ass with the G-string resonated with some people. It just wasn't for me. I mean, hey, man ass is hilarious sometimes. But being that he was the director's brother, and I knew that I was like picturing the conversation as like, Brian, we need something here for the scene. Why? Because Otto and Henry are having a conversation and moving the plot along. But uh, I was thinking uh, you wear a G-string and show your ass out of nowhere. Genius. Boom. Let's put it in. So I don't know. It just, <laughs> it just didn't work for me. All right, yeah. I mean, this set of scenes to me too. I I, I agree. It is it does feel like there's some filler here. Um, first of all, I'm gonna start by saying though, when he says, uh, "This is the perfect complimentary wine," if we were eating ass, pal. Let me tell you something. If that's supposed to be an insult, you missed the mark. Sounds like I need some of that wine. Um, Doctor Berman putting the blood on his pancakes, I thought was funny. Like. That kind of stuff. I, okay, I, I dig that. That that was hilarious. Um, then we get you know Pearl 
we t- we fill her in. She knows what's going on. She knows their secret. Uh, she handled that discovery way better than I think I would have. So <laughs> um, I don't know how realistic that was. If you find out that your coworkers are all vampires, uh, probably would have freaked out a little bit more. So maybe her talking to the dummy there makes a little bit more sense. Maybe she actually is insane now. But um, yeah, I just, last thing I have is just this movie still, this set of scenes is, it drags a little bit. To me, it's still just so damn fun. Dow coming in wearing the women's underwear. Like, that's just. <laughs> that gave me the biggest. Order? By the way, I'm back, everyone. That gave me the Direction? biggest laugh of the oh, whole film. laugh. Fulfill. Laugh. Oh. Laugh. No shame on my game, baby. <laughs> but no, that shit, like, it was just, it was so stupid, but it was hilarious, man. I, I laughed my ass off. All right, guys, here's the ending. A month ago, Otto says Turner was sharp. Mike was a kiss ass. We see Mike getting him coffee. Pearl is putting more of Mike's things up and she follows voices. Bunyan finds her and says she shouldn't be here. Otto and Henry have Dow check out Mike's computer on a plot to kill Turner. Bunyan asks, you sure you heard Rebecca's voice? He asks her to go get Henry and Otto. He tells Otto about a bunch of emails between Mike and Thomas poisoning Turner. Otto asks Turner if it was Mike's idea to hire the consultant. Bunyan walks a dark tunnel and finds a ladder into a lit room. He climbs the ladder and finds another room. Mike stops getting emails from Thomas and gets similar emails from Stephen. Stephen finds Bunyan and launches him into the wall. Jeff cracks jokes, what are they doing in the dark, and they ask if he's adventurous. The crew go through the tunnel and up the ladder now. We see Bunyan strapped to a table by Stephen. Henry walks in with a gun, telling him to let him go. Stephen says, put down the gun or I kill him. Steven says he has their co-workers heavily sedated in the drawers. Henry finds Rebecca dead. Henry says, give me the gun, and Jeff shoots Henry. Steven says, I've been looking for that, the power of positive thinking. Jeff catches Otto and shoots him in the back of the leg. Jeff chases after Pearl and can't find her. We hear gunshots, and Steven says to shake off the ricochets. Dr. Berman performs the rinse on Turner. Some others get weapons. Jeff continues to chase after Pearl, who we see has a gunshot in his side. Stephen says, I am Netherman, but I am not one of you. He unbuttons his shirt and says he was chosen, revealing his wound. We see that Cleveland's heart is in Stephen's chest. He tells them Turner has brainwashed them into mediocrity. Jeff walks in and Stephen says he is fine. Have crackers and ginger ale. Pearl grabs a crowbar and sneaks back in the room. Turner wakes up asking if he killed Mike. Jeff is stabbed in the heart by Pearl with the crowbar and Stephen shoots her three times. Otto gets free and takes the empty gun from him, but he's out of bullets. Otto shoves the gun into Steven's heart. That's a piss poor attitude and says Otto isn't a team player as he sits in a pool of blood. Otto grabs Pearl and Dr. Berman says she won't make it through the night, Otto. Otto goes to meet with Turner by his hospital bed. Turner says nothing supersedes keeping Berm Tech going. Turner says he'd appreciate it if he took one of the managerial spots. Otto asks why they lied about the stone. Turner says the stone had to be broken up. It's in a lot of little pieces and is usually in the last places you'd look. The hideous lamps. There's one more thing I want to do, Turner says. We're in Pearl's room now and we see she has a big scar on her chest. Turner donated Pearl his heart. Otto is giving a presentation and Pearl asks how long it took to put together this presentation. Bunyan now tells him of the reorganization and relaxing the policy of outdoor activities. Bunyan dismisses them for lunch and Otto asks Pearl if she's hungry. Upbeat music plays as the end credits roll. Brian, what do you think about the ending? Hey, we're back to the good stuff here. I feel like after the last couple of sets of scenes. Uh, by the way, I hadn't mentioned it, but Judd Nelson, man, he's almost unrecognizable to me in this movie. Like, I never watched Empire, so I don't think I've seen anything with him that I can remember since, hell, The Breakfast Club and, and New Jack City. So, anyway, tangent, sorry. Um, the Final say, final fighting scene here, you know, with the uh, with the Mexican standoff and and everything, it's perfectly fine for what the movie is. I, I thought it was enjoyable. Um, and hey, the guy in the hospital with with Pearl read my mind. I don't remember ever seeing a man stabbed to death with a gun before. Right on, right on point. Exactly <laughs> what I was thinking at that time. Points for originality too. Um, my only complaint I'd say was a soundtrack. It didn't really fit with what was happening. Is all like. I don't know. It's, look, I'm nobody, but uh, I think I would have cut it a little bit tighter too. Um, also, in a movie like this, with all the craziness and gags, 
you really wouldn't think it would have an honest to goodness, profound line in it. But when Turner says people always think about what they would do if they had a day or a week to live, but nobody ever stops to think about how would you would change if you lived forever. I mean, that's pretty deep, right? I mean, shit, I thought so anyway. Um, all in all, fun ending to a to a movie I had a good time with. Yeah, so the ending here gets silly in the best way to me. <laughs> like there's, like I said, I I love the kill. Spoiler: My favorite kill of the movie is being stabbed with a gun because you don't see that very often. It's a very true statement that they made. Uh, I look now. I I think the story here kind of gets. I'm not gonna say it loses me, but I don't. It was kind of hard to follow exactly who was what and who was who and 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 everything else. But I, I just Daryl Hammond, his character to me just carries this set of, or you know this ending set of scenes here as he, as he's kind of on his back. I think it's great. Um, I will say this is my only small nitpick is this movie has a happy ending. God, I didn't want it to. I wanted something stupid and silly to happen so bad. Like I, I really would have liked Amy Davidson's character to just say, nah, I'm cool without all this vampire shit. Like, I think it would have been, I don't know, funnier to me for some reason. Uh, but no, it's a better set of scenes than the last one, which I wasn't on for, but all in all, not a bad ending, fun and some really good one liners as the rest of the scenes have. Yeah. Um, so the realization of Mike's plot is interesting. I think it's a, it's a good setup for a payoff. Um, because had we not had that, it's just like, all right, what, what's going on in this movie? Are we getting anywhere? Um, so I, I like that. Jeff turning on Henry was also a shocking twist because as they're going down this tunnel, this secret door, um, he really sold his skepticism really well. Uh, he acted like he didn't want to know parts of going down there and all that. So uh, I thought that was a good uh, twist. Um, Stephen being Thomas Watson was hilarious to me. Because it's a good callback to the Garfield storyline. But if you go back and, and look up pictures of Thomas Watson, Judd Nelson actually looked like him with the beard. So that was awesome. Well done there. Um, I thought that it's a very enjoyable ending. I mean, nothing spectacular. But, um, yeah, you know, it's it's just I enjoyed it. All righty, guys. Any final thoughts? Are we just jump into social media comments and questions? All right. Not a lot this week, but I kind of expect it since this isn't the most well-known movie. Uh, let's go to Twitter first. Uh, teammate uh, on staff, Kevin Scanlon, commented, I've never heard of this, but guess I have some homework to do. Yeah, you do, brother. Yeah, you do. But I also saw where he replied to you, Dustin, where he saw the trailer and he loved the cast. So definitely a yeah. very fun cast. Yeah, and also uh, I think there's no better time than now to implement a new staff rule. I think that our entire staff should watch the movie each week. Boom. Implemented. <laughs> Boom. That just happened. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's jump over to Instagram now. Jay Hambrick, 88, new blood donor of the show, actually. He commented, <laughs> what did I just watch, LOL? After 15 <laughs> minutes, I thought about turning it off and watching Blue's Clues, but I just, couldn't, but I just couldn't turn it off. I give this movie a four. The story wasn't bad, but it felt too low budget. I respect yeah. that. You know, I, I can understand. So I, I think that's a great compliment to the movie where you want to turn it off, but you just can't, you can't turn it off because that means it holds your attention. Well, come on, man. A four just cause that's low budget. It's low bottom, my man. It's, an, it's more enjoyable than a four. Shit. Nico's probably going to give a three. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, y'all got any fun facts? I don't have any for tonight. No, sir. Said mine during the only two that I had. Gotcha, gotcha. Money Mike, you got a budget for us tonight? Yes. The the budget was seven hundred twenty five thousand dollars. Um if anyone could find a gross, that would be awesome because I sure as hell couldn't find one. Maybe your Google's better than mine. <laughs> no, sorry, I use IMDB Pro because they're so smart over there that I have I have to turn to those geniuses. They always know what they're talking about. Well, Absolutely. except for the ratings of movies sometimes they don't know shit, but Exactly, because I have a higher rating for IMDb because I just saw it a little while ago. Let's go. Boom. Nikos is lower. Not much. Not 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 much higher. Not much higher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's jump into our favorite kill, least favorite kill in the rating. Uh, does it, who wants to go first tonight? 
I'll go first since I picked it. There you go. That's um, spirit, Dustin. Yeah, go you know, ahead set the bar pretty high. Uh, favorite kill? I went with uh, Steven because, yeah, getting stabbed to death with a gun is kind of ironic and funny. And we don't see it often. So I thought, yeah, why not? And to be honest with you, for this movie to have as low of a budget as it did, the blood didn't look bad in this. So you got a big pool of blood underneath his body. Uh, when Mike's dead in the opening scene, pretty good effects there, good blood. So shout out to that. But yeah, I went with Steven. Least favorite kill, I just went with any of the off screen ones Emmy, uh, Emmett, Murdy, Rebecca, any of those three, because we don't see how they die. We don't really see much of uh, what's going on there. So just any of them. But as far as the rating, uh, like I said, I really enjoy this movie. It's a fun watch. It's easy, short, uh, good cast. It's something I could put on as background noise. It's something I could put on and be entertained by um, either way. So I gave this movie an eight and a quarter. Jesus. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll go next. <laughs> just because I knew I had down. to overcompensate for hey. Nico's. <laughs> <laughs> Man, just rated my own movie two points higher just to offset me. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. I'll go first. My favorite kill. It's going to be a random one, but I'm going to go with Mike just because it started off with you weren't. I wasn't expecting a dead guy to be in the in the boss's office right at the very beginning. And I agree, Dustin. The effects, the blood, everything looked great in this movie. Uh, least favorite kill. I'm going to be opposite of Dustin. I'm going with Steven, just because he didn't put up no fight. He just got stabbed right in the heart and put up nothing. Like it, it was pathetic, pitiful, Steven. Well, he wasn't expecting to get stabbed with a gun. Dude, we only, we only had the budget to go an hour and 33 minutes. We had to go home. <laughs> he just went to the finish. He, did, he couldn't put up a fight. Yeah, but he could. He could have punched Steve from Blue's Clues in the face <laughs> once at least. I mean, good night. All right, anywho, uh, just going to wrap up my uh, my thoughts. I think I've already said it. Uh, I think it's a well-made movie, honestly, for what the budget was. This, the, the cast is fine. Uh, the, like I just said, the effects look great. I'm just not a big fan of it. Uh, it's not super funny to me. It's not scary. But, you know, it's just not in my personal niche of what I like. Uh, but I am higher than what Dustin said. I did not give it a three. I gave it a four. <laughs> and I want to I want to clarify too before you guys go. When I say eight point two five, if you go back and listen to some other episodes that I've rated around that, I don't mean that this one's as good as those. This one I grade on how enjoyable was it? Yeah. Because it's pretty much understood that it's not a very good movie, but it's very enjoyable. So that's my scale. Gotcha, Mike. You want to go or me? Uh, well, doesn't matter before y'all go, I'll say this. I, like, like you mentioned earlier, Dustin, I uh, about WrestleManiac or this, I rated this a point higher, but I would watch WrestleManiac over that just because I had more fun. I just thought that movie was made like okay. it just was a dog shit movie. But, but see, it was fun to watch. The actors in that one could like they were bad actors, right? Yeah, right. That's what I meant about. Yeah, I was gonna say there's yeah, the that's, difference. That's what there. I meant earlier when I was talking yeah. about Daryl Hammond, how it's like he's acting, he's delivering his lines in a bad way, like he's acting like a bad actor, but it's done well here. So yeah. All right, I'll go ahead and go. My actually favorite kill was Steven, because you don't see a man get stabbed with a gun that often. And you know, I thought it was a pretty cool kill. And by the way. Steve Burns killed Steve on screen. That's pretty cool. Anyway, um, <laughs> my least favorite kill is all the off-screen ones just because, yeah, that, duh. But all in all, man, fun watch. Glad Dustin picked it. It gave me a chance to watch something I had never seen, which is very rare and hard to do. So I'm very glad that he did. And I also, like I said at the beginning, I hope you guys go actually watch the movie. I say this every week. I know some of you listen to us first and then go watch. This is a movie that if you've made it this far, that means you've already listened to us instead of watching. But I really hope you go watch it along with listening to our show. Um, fun cast, fun premise, fun concept. And not everything always lands. Some of the comedy isn't great to me, but there's some really good one-liners. This could have used some more horror elements. I, I thought them, the way they ate people was a little, you know, so-so, not not nonchalant. It was played for laughs. I know it's a horror comedy, so that's fine. But... Uh, all in all, man, a pretty good mixed bag and a fun watch. I gave this movie a 6.25. Okay. Um, as far as kills goes, my favorite was Franklin Abercrombie sneaking on a plate of, or sneaking in a plate of shrimp scampi back in 1958. I like how it uh, burned him up. 
Worst kill is uh, Hazel the One Armed Lunch Lady, which sounds like an Adam Sandler song. Like if you know, if we're being honest. Um, I don't like. I said it's a fun movie. Just just go into it really not expecting some masterpiece. But I think if you just try to have fun with it, you can. I think because I did. Um, I actually gave it a five point seven five. Okay. So that gives us a composite score of 6.0625. So uh, about half a point higher than IMDb's 5.5. But only 1.4 thousand people. So 1,400 people essentially have rated it on IMDb. Those 1,400 people don't know what they're talking about. Well, uh, Dustin, like you said, uh, we cover everything on this show uh, from blockbusters like Shutter Island all the way down to indie horror movies like this. And I remember a few weeks ago, I think before, you know, when we launched our little uh, picture announcing what our picks for this month, I was like, I feel like this might be the most diverse month we've ever had, like pick wise. <laughs> we've done some, a lot of like ghost. We went from Ghostbusters, Shutter Island, Orphan to um, <laughs> fuck Nether Beast Incorporated. Slipped my mind. It's been a diverse month. And I, I really think that's what makes our show special. We're not afraid to tackle different stuff. And I, I like that, honestly whether or not we like the movie or not. Uh, any final thoughts for you? Shout out our blood donors and Brian's going to announce how we're going to kick off October. Good. All righty. Uh, thank you to all of our blood donors. We really appreciate y'all. Uh, Camper level reoccurring Clayton J Nina, Michelle Mirza, Andrew Ferguson, Carrie Adams, the horror movie crew podcast, Alex Seligson, Eric Doolittle and Sean Irwin. Our camp counselor reoccurring our Hunter Nelson, Dennis Kennedy, Edwin Hernandez gun, Joe Swinford, Jennifer Davis from the Too Close to Home podcast, Heather Smith, Kylie Denise, all the way from Australia, Adrian Aiello, and Jake Hambrick, our new blood donor. Really appreciate y'all. Uh, our final guide donors that we have uh, film reviews to do for are Christian Cunningham and Matt Sears. Just want to say we really appreciate y'all. Y'all really, really do help us out a lot. Take a big burden off of us. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, what's your pick for next week, brother? All right, so we're going back to the 90s, which I know Nico's probably very excited about. He loves the 80s and the 90s. Uh, Well, Kyle, I love this movie, so yeah. This this one's got friend of the show Tara Reid in it, friend of the show Julian Richings, friend of the show Daniel Harris, and big-time friend of the show Robert England in it. It's 1998's Urban Legend. Um, I kind of just feel like this is... uh, um, I wanted, when I was doing something for, for October... Uh, I wanted just something that kind of, you know, gave you that Halloween type of atmosphere. And, and this is one that reminds me of that. So uh, this movie has a killer cast in it. Uh, I love it. It's got a horror killer alum legend. It's, it's got Brad Dorf in it at the beginning. Cast. Love it. What do you say, Brian? I'm sorry. A killer. Cast. I forgot. I forget Brad Dorf's in that movie. Jared Leto's in it. Rebecca it's Gayhart. It's I mean, yeah, like Rebecca Josh Gayhart. Jackson. Shit. This place, this is killing. Charlie Conway himself. This movie scarred me from eating Pop Rocks and drinking a Pepsi at the same time. But <laughs> God, you know what's? I ain't gonna lie. Just really quick on Nether Beast Incorporated. I just thought of it. The movie came out in 07. Steve Burns looks old as shit. Hey, he looks younger now. Well, no, he looks younger now because he did the right thing and shaved his head, that, which is what I keep trying to do. But people keep yelling the at me. The reason he left Blues Clues was because uh, he was losing his I hair. Know, I know. And- he uh-huh. wanted to shave it, and they said no, he couldn't shave it, and he couldn't wear a hat, and he felt that he didn't belong on a kid's show going bald, so he left. Fair, fair enough on that. Fair fair enough. Enough. All, right. I know. all right, guys, any final thoughts before we get out of here? All right, just want to thank all our fans and listeners. Really appreciate y'all. Uh, like I said, like us, subscribe us, follow us on all of our social medias. Uh, if, if you listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, leave us a rating, five-star rating preferably. And write us a review. Uh, We love reading our reviews, and we really appreciate all of our reviews and our comments. Uh, Y'all have a good one. Just want to remind everybody. Uh